Hi guys, I'm Dr. Gabrielle Lyon here with my longtime mentor, who you all should know at this point, Dr. Donald Lehman. And if you like this video, please like it and share it. Don't forget to sign up for my newsletter on my website at drgabriellelyon.com. I'm really excited about today's conversation. Right now, you're hearing a lot of different paradigms as it relates to obesity. So Don and I talk a lot about this. There's the obesogenic paradigm. There's the muscle-centric paradigm, which is what Dr. Lehman and I believe in. And then there is kind of the liver gluconeogenesis discussion. And really, when you think about all these things, it's about obesity. You can either think about the pathology of obesity, which is really that obesogenic obesity model, or you can think about the solution, which is the muscle-centric model. So Don, I don't know if you want to kind of take it from there and talk a little bit about you know, really the older history, how everybody focused on adiposity at the core, that it was really about insulin and fat tissue and obesity. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we all realize that there are three major tissues that get involved. I mean, muscle certainly is involved, adipose tissue, fat tissue, and also the liver. And they're all three uh, somehow involved. The adipose and muscle are getting rid of carbohydrates and you know, using energy. Uh, and the liver is responsible for sort of creating or, or metering in the, the glucose. Um, I remember clear back when I was in graduate school, which unfortunately is like <laughs> Just 30, <last> year. <laughs> 30 some years ago. Um, I mean, people were convinced that adipose was the cause of obesity and people studied everything from brown fat to regular white adipose tissue and that was going to solve everything but my problem with that is that's always the end point that's when you're already fat so totally. the adipose then becomes dysregulated you get inflammation there's no question about all that but it's because you've already had a problem with metabolism and as you and i always talk the problem is is you're taking in too much energy and particularly too many carbohydrates for muscle to handle Right. And then the liver has to get into some kind of a metabolic model of getting rid of it, either down-regulating the liver, which has real limits to it, or storing it in adipose, which is where most of it ends up going. And eventually, then you have pathology that we understand. But the cause is simply we're getting too many carbs for the muscle to dispose of, which right either means you're not exercising enough or you're just eating too many. <laughs> or, you know, arguably you might not even have enough muscle mass. So 80% of glucose disposal is in the skeletal muscle. That is the primary site for glucose disposal, 80% yeah. of glucose. And if, and if you choose to be sedentary, that 80% is a very small number. Yes, yep. Yeah, and it's also, um, you know, when you think about muscle tissue as the primary site for glucose disposal, that comes first because if you are unable to dispose of that glucose, glucose is cytotoxic. Now you're looking to go to the liver and adipose tissue. You've got to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, you and I talk about sort of the obligatory glucose use yeah. in the body all the time where, you know, the brain and the red blood cells and nerve tissue uh, need glucose, but that's only around 70 grams per day. Right. And most Americans are eating well over 300. That all has to be used by muscle. And if you can only use glucose at about, you know, 45 to 60 grams per hour of exercise, that's a lot of exercise you have to do to get rid of 350 grams. Yeah. And then per rest, and you know, you guys, there's a great, I have a great post on my Instagram about the talks about obligatory glucose use. And it's really about how much glucose is utilized by the brain, the liver, um, you know, red blood cells. Do you want to just kind of briefly give people a, a snapshot of that? Yeah. I, I uh, The non-exercise component. Yeah. The... I mean, we've already, we just commented on the tissues, the brain, the nervous tissue, red blood cells, the kidney are all tissues that only can use glucose well. There are tissues like the muscle that can use fat and glucose, but those tissues only use glucose. And that's one of the reasons why the body has a process called gluconeogenesis. Otherwise, we would 
be likely to die. So, so we actually have to continuously make glucose to support those tissues. And most of the estimates are somewhere between 70 and 80 grams per day. Right. And that's really where the RDA comes from. The RDA basically starts with a number of about 80 grams is what would be called the EAR, the estimated average requirement. Mm -hmm. Then it uses a safety va uh, value of about two standard deviations. So the RDA for carbohydrates is set at 130 grams, and that's where that comes from. Which may be a little bit high. Yeah, it probably is for most people, but yeah. you know, the reality is you can have a pretty good diet and a pretty safe amount of carbohydrates with that for most people. Some people are extremely sensitive to carbohydrates. Some people are extremely sedentary and just can't burn them. Right, uh, and that actually moves us into the concept that you know the, there's a carbohydrate threshold, which we have talked about in some earlier videos. The average American ingests 300 grams of carbohydrate a day. The recommended amount is 130 grams per day, and that's really based on the needs of the tissue, which is arguably because there's a safety zone too high, but where the issue becomes where one could essentially argue for lower carbohydrates, and Don and I might have some uh, a little bit of a different view here, but if you have metabolic inflexibility or just metabolic impairment, you have insulin resistance already, you have difficulty managing blood sugar, and you have adiposity, so you're, you have unhealthy adiposity, um, I think that that's where decreasing carbohydrates, decreasing not only the total caloric load, but also from a clinical standpoint, decreasing carbohydrates, which is perhaps where the benefit of the very low carbohydrate diets come in to play. Um, love your opinion on that. Yeah, I, there's kind of this ongoing debate in the, in the Twitter world and <laughs> to some extent in the, in the literature about carbohydrates versus fat. And I think one needs to separate out whether you're talking about above or below your calorie needs. Um, you and I right now are talking about people eating calories above their calorie needs. And yeah. when you do that, carbohydrates are very dangerous because they're toxic to the body. I mean, that's what diabetes is. And so when you're in an environment of too many calories and you choose to be high carb, that's a very dangerous situation. If you have your car, if your calories are in check or even below, you're losing weight, then your decision between carbohydrate and fat ends up being more of a satiety in how you feel. And one of the things we found is that if we can get carbohydrates down below 140 grams per day, we almost always make major metabolic changes in, in patients or subjects that we're working with. It may be that some individuals need to get down to as low as 50. I've seen uh, that in clinical uh, practice. I've absolutely I, seen that without a doubt. I don't disagree with that, but for the majority of people, they'll see major metabolic improvements like 30% drop in triglycerides if they get their carbs below 140 grams per day. Um, Yes, I have seen that. And it's very interesting because you do see a lot of misinformation in the Twitter world. And, uh, you know, food is very emotional for people. So it, it ends up becoming very confusing as it relates to good science, which who knows why, but it does. Um, as it relates to the very low carb diet, so under 50 grams or less, have you had any experience with that? I know that, you know, obviously in your research lab, which I was a part of, we never went that low. For the most, I don't even think, yeah, I, I don't think that, that we did go that low ever. I mean, I haven't personally studied it and I haven't personally tried it. So, you know, I'm not an expert in a keto type diet at all. Uh, I certainly, you know, I've certainly worked with a lot of those folks and I right. know them well. One of the things in the literature though, is if you compare my work research with, um, which where we targeted like 130 to 140 grams per carbohydrate per day in a weight loss setting versus uh, the people who did keto type diets like Eric Westman and Jeff yeah. Foley. And we get pretty much the same results in weight loss and metabolic changes they do. So for me, I think it becomes a more personal preference. And I kind of agree with some of the other comments that 
I think a keto type diet is more difficult to stick with for the average person mm -hmm. than 130 grams per day of carbs. Um, I just find that it's a little bit more livable for the average American to try and do. I, I actually totally agree with that. And then the question becomes in, if we believe that muscle is the organ of longevity, uh, does the ketogenic diet optimize muscle tissue versus a optimal protein diet, which is really targeted at those uh, high quality, you know, leucine based protein mm -hmm. sources? You know. Yeah, I, cert I certainly always recommend a protein-centric type diet. I think that you need to make a decision about what you're going to do for protein first. And it could be really high, it could be more moderate, it could be relatively low, but that is an important decision of how you're going to protect your muscle. Totally. And then you have to layer in your exercise decisions that go with it and your age and all of those things. But you need everybody needs to focus first and foremost on their protein decision and what decision you make has a huge impact on how you choose the rest of your lifestyle yes it does all right guys if you like this video we keep them short and sweet please like them share them and subscribe to the newsletter